Welcome to a Legendarium special about the Burke and Wills expedition, which sought out Australia's legendary inland sea. This episode will focus on Robert O'Hara Burke, a gentleman soldier with big dreams that he hoped to realize in Australia's forbidding outback. Robert O'Hara Burke was born around May 6, 1820, the precise date is unknown, in County Galway, Ireland. However, Burke did not consider himself Irish. His family descended from the soldiers and settlers who followed Oliver Cromwell in his conquest of Ireland nearly 200 years prior. His wealthy Protestant family lorded over the impoverished Catholic tenant farmers who made them rich. Burke traveled to England as a young man to study at Woolwich Academy. Of an adventurous disposition, he took a commission as a cavalry lieutenant in the Austrian army. Later, he returned home to join the Irish Mounted Police. In 1853, Burke emigrated to Australia and made his way in the police force of Victoria, rising from inspector to senior inspector. When the Crimean War erupted, he took leave to serve his queen in the battlefield. Alas, he arrived too late to join the fighting and returned to Australia, where he became superintendent of of police in the Castlemaine district. Despite being a well-bred gentleman of fine manners who easily mingled with high society, the lifelong bachelor began to slip into eccentric behavior. Most troublingly, the 39-year-old Burke became obsessed with a 17-year-old girl named Julia Matthews who worked in local theater. Julia proved less than impressed with the middle-aged country policeman. While living in coastal Australia, Burke learned of the bone-dry interior of Australia, still a blank space on the map to most Europeans. As is often the case, imagination took the place of facts. During the colony's earliest days, some Irish convicts came to believe they could walk 200 miles north to China. Aborigines, hoping to entice the Europeans to leave, concocted fanciful tales of a large lake in the middle of the continent. A few convicts ran into the desert seeking China, and none of them returned. Yet the mystery of what lay in the outback still enticed European minds. Even Australia's new ruling class indulged in fancy, imagining a vast inland sea within the bone-dry continent. As Burke neared his 40th year, the Royal Society of Victoria, made up of Scottish crofters turned sheep magnates, organized an expedition. Expedition. It sought to prove or disprove the existence of the Inland Sea. The recklessly courageous Burke, despite a few achievements in his life, believed his thirst for distinction to be unfulfilled. Burke feared that his career would peter out in humdrum police duties. So in 1860, he took command of the expedition, despite having no irrelevant experience that troubled neither him nor his Royal Society backers, who were more impressed by his military experience. Burke's second-in-command became a surveyor named William Wills. Together, they planned a route north to Cooper's Creek towards the Gulf of Carpentaria. The Royal Society specially imported camels from India for the Burke and Wills expedition. Royal Society funds also provided horses and wagons, enough food for two years, six tons of firewood, 57 buckets, and 45 yards of green gossamer to make veils. The party included Burke, Wills as surveyor and meteorologist, a camel master, two German scientific officers, a foreman, and nine laborers. This exotic band only added to the excitement when the party set out from Melbourne on August 20th, 1860 amidst cheering crowds. Shortly after plunging into the outback, Burke briefly abandoned his men to hurry back in a last-ditch attempt to woo Julia Matthews. This proved as unsuccessful as his previous 
various attempts. Burke then returned to his men and planned to establish bases that would ease the way for a second group which would haul the bulkier supplies. They made a stately march through the settled districts and reached Menendee on the Darling River around the beginning of October. Burke believed that previous expeditions inland failed because of bulky and heavy cargoes, and in his haste to travel light, he abandoned supplies he judged unnecessary, including lime juice. Burke's party reached the Cooper's Creek water holes located in Queensland that November. Tragically, Burke then showed that he lacked the temperament to lead such a dangerous venture. Burke, Wills, and two other men named Charles Gray and John King made a hurry dash north to the Gulf of Carpentaria ahead of their supply train. This would give them fame as the first Europeans to cross Australia. They left their stores at Cooper's Creek in the charge of a man named William Bray, who would wait their return for three months. During February 1861, the explorers discovered that thick swamps and jungle scrub separated them from the coast, and they turned back. During the return trip, Gray died from a combination of dehydration and exhaustion. However, when the three starving and ragged survivors returned to Cooper's Creek in April, they found to their horror, that Bray had given them up. Bray left earlier that same day after waiting for them for four months, one more than agreed. Bray left only a tiny portion of the provisions and a note explaining where to find them. Wills wanted to follow Bray, but Burke chose to make for a sheep station to the south, optimistically called Mount Hopeless. Tragically, Burke underestimated the distance to the station and a shortage of water forced the survivors back to Cooper's Creek. Crippled with exhaustion, they failed to fend for themselves. At least four men died of scurvy, which could have been prevented with the lime juice that Burke abandoned the previous year. Although friendly Aborigines occasionally gave them dried fish, Burke and Wills both died of thirst. Bent on death or glory, Burke achieved the first. John King, the sole survivor, would be returned by a rescue expedition sent in September, and the next January, Australians buried the desiccated remains of Burke and Wills with honor in Melbourne. The city revered the dead explorers, despite their errors, as heroes and martyrs to human endeavor. The citizens of Melbourne even erected a memorial in their honor, and the Wills Journal, found on his dried-out raisin-like remains, became the official account of the doomed expedition. In death, Robert O'Hara Burke achieved the fame he failed to achieve in life. That wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.